If we talk, now 500,000 they go summer house, call them hate speech. But fear not, my ego don't come. In go touch light every corner, looks and cranny of all these bad, bad people where they spoil our country. <laughs> so my people make we love Every corner. Okay, some people be they hala say they want the power. Chai. Them be promise us say we go get light and power. Them hustle so they so they they can't get the power. Hmm. But now they know they do anything with the power. Sheer. Every day dollar just they get the higher power. Over naira. See them talk say make we off mind. But then go say my ego don't come. So my people make you loud. Oh, yeah, yeah. They do even no one make person talk. Hmm. Them say that my egun, that man too they talk. He too they talk. Say my egun diary, he they hot like pepper. But every day then they tip money in buck. Come on. Woman picking day the street they hawk. Still them talk say make we not talk. But thank God say my egun don't come. So my people make you love. Oh yeah yeah, my egun don't come. Oh yeah yeah, my people make you shout. Oh, yeah. Hello dear. Good morning to you, good afternoon to you, and good evening to you from wherever you are joining me from. It is Mayegun's midday or brunch time hour. Thank you. I mean, this uh, broadcast is uh, more or less like a recitation. It is not, uh, you know, discussion on the current affairs in that uh, contraption. So I got uh, the book that a lot of you have been making a demand sort of for that we should, if we can lay our hand on one, eh, share the content of it. And we have finally got one and we are starting that this afternoon. So if you are this morning, depends on what time you are joining me from, share the broadcast. It's going to be interesting. Fatherless people. How, I'm sorry, the secret story of how the Nigerians missed the road to the promised land. It's a recommended book. Eh? And we will read it from Pali to Pali as long as it takes. Share the broadcast. <laughs> I 
Thank you so much. Again, our special thanks goes to Yomi Totu. Uh, this is uh, procured and sent to Mayegun's Diary Political for the general uh, use or general reading and uh, history that a lot of us mm, will love and some of us eh, will likely question a lot of things that we have heard being told here and there. So this is a, I mean, it's, uh, a piece of a literary work, right? That tells more the story of uh, the people forced together in a single contraption when they have a lot, I mean, so much not in common. And according to this uh, author, Dele Ogun said, you can't understand the culture of any country without knowing its history. That's so true. You can't explain the politics without knowing the history. And he said, that is uh, from uh, William Ague, former British secretary. Share this broadcast. Nigeria, a fatherless people. Thank you very much. I think I have a copy of uh, this. If you look at the side camera, that, that smaller camera, I think we do have this uh, map, which we believe is the map that really explains or close to, uh, you know, a map that shows the representation of every ethnic nationalities and tribes in Nigeria. So you see down there, right? I'm going to put it on the screen. I think I have a copy here, if you don't mind. So good morning to you once again. Good afternoon to you and good evening. To you, from wherever you are joining me from, it is Mayegun's uh, brunch time live. And we just we are just about to go into some historical uh, trance now. And this is the kind of broadcast that you can listen to and still do other things. For example, if you are driving, you do not need to see the video. If you are walking, all you have to do is to put the, you know, uh -huh, put your episode on, and then you can listen to this as cool as possible, because I will be reading. Well, a lot of us have been trying to see, uh, to have uh, an opportunity, okay, to be able to take a look into the past while we are looking for answers for our dilemma of today, before we, I mean, I mean, to decide where we will end in the future, kind of history matters. And a lot of us seems, I believe, must have seen this book, right? So a lot I've heard about it. And this is my own first time that I'm actually, you know, having it uh, in my hands. So whatever I'm going to kind of see from this book, like many of you, it is going to be my first time. However, uh, like I said, it is pure reading. Okay. And for those who recommended this book, especially for Larry, my dear brother, sir, eh, this book also sort of explains, from what I have heard, though, explains the... Uh, you know, the bit by bit of the existence of everybody in that uh, contraption called Nigeria today. In a way, eh, you'll be able to understand why some 
tribes or ethnic nationalities, they find commonance eh, in themselves beyond just their languages. I'm talking about due to their proximity, trade, and the rest of that, they ended up becoming just almost one. Kind of, right? Okay. Um, according to this uh, author, he said here, Nigeria's 371 ethnic groups. And I would love to kind of read all of them out. But we can come back to that later. That's some piece of information there. Okay? Where they are and all. So let's start uh, with uh, the introduction. So this is a quote. During the negotiation for the independence of Nigeria, the view of the Secretary of State at that time, with which I agreed, was that in Nigeria, we should attempt to put together a large and powerful state with ample material resources, which would play a leading part in the affairs of the continent and the world. And this was from uh, Sir, Peter's, sorry, Sir Peter Smithers. Now let's read. Every once in a while, a book comes along that changes our understanding of the world in which we live. The turn, up, turn around book for me was Professor Jared Diamond's uh, Gone, Jams and Steel. A short history of everybody. It explained comprehensively and without any of the gaps in logic so often left by alternative religious and geneticists uh, narratives, the pattern of human development that we see across the world today. Diamond's central argument is that the underdevelopment of the southern hemisphere and the relative overdevelopment of the northern hemisphere is neither the result of God's will, as suggested by many believers, nor a consequence of genetic differences. It is, Diamond says, the product of differences in geographical and climatic conditions. It was the realization gained from this book that the explanation for seemingly inexplainable human social condi conditions may not be beyond human understanding that led me to believe that there might be, I mean, there might equally be an explanation for the mystery that is Nigeria, a country of which so much is heard but about which so little is understood. This work, was further inspired and provoked by an admonition in the preface to another book. This one written by one of my own people, The History of the Yoruba by the Reverend Samuel Johnson in quotes. Educated natives of Yoruba are well acquainted with the history of England, with that of Rome and Greece but of the history of their own country, they know nothing, whatever. This reproach, it is one of the author's objects to remove. So the word struck home and struck deep. At the time, Johnson wrote them, I'll take it back again, sorry. According to this author, said, the word struck home and struck deep. At the time Johnson wrote them, in 1897, his country was Yoruba. By the time the book first saw the light of the day in 1921, upon first publication, the Yoruba people, through, I mean, sorry, though not all of them, had been amalgamated with 370 other ethnic groups to become Nigeria. Being the land of my birth and of my formative years, the inquiry which Johnson's work set off was more than purely intellectual. Growing up and then living in England, but forever looking back, 
I was keen to understand why it was the it was that the devil, I mean the evil of the slave trade had afflicted the land as it did. I then wanted to understand why colonization followed so closely upon slavery and its abolition. Above all, I wanted to know the answer to the question often asked of me by the new generation of young Nigerians. What was there before Nigeria? Ajasa Street in Onikon, Lagos, was the location of the family home at the time of my birth in 1962. Situated behind the old Federal Parliament building in what is now Tafawa Balewa Square, the first air that I took in was heavy with the politics of newly independent country. My father, a former clerk in the colonial service, was one of the many former colonial subjects who came to the United Kingdom in the early 1960s to pursue further studies. He and others of his type were Readying, I mean, so readying themselves for the new opportunities and responsibilities that independence promised. I wanted to understand the country, the country's short journey from a colony status on the 1st of January 1900 to independence on the 1st of October 1960, and the effect of this period of tutelage upon the people and their politics. I only recently became aware that. Before he became premier of the western region of Nigeria, our next door neighbor at number 20 Ajasa Street was Samuel Ladoke Akintola, who plays a major part in Nigeria's post independence story and specifically in the bloody turmoil that gripped the, I mean, that region from 1962 until the first military coup. January 1966, when I was seven years old, my parents, who were then living in the UK, sent me to join the family and to be educated like the white man's children. The Biafran war tragedy was just nearing its end at the time of my arrival. Each night, we watched the unfolding tragedy with images of death and famine on the BBC 9 o'clock news without any inkling that I would one day become married to one of those young Biafran girls. The initial resistance to the idea from mothers sparked an interest into the origins of the antipathy between my wife's Igbo people and my own Yoruba people and into the Biafran, and Biafran story. As an extension of this, I wanted to get to the bottom of the rivalry between the Nigerians of the South, chiefly the Igbos and the Yorubans. On the one side, and the Nigerians of the North, principally the Aousas and the Fulani, on the other side. Above all, I wanted to understand the reason for the state of underdevelopment which plagued the country, even as it was so blessed with human and material resources. It was a bit of mine. It was a habit of mine on the occasional return trips to my village in the Yoruba Atland to sit in to sit in on the traditional family meetings and all male assembly convened in the parlor of the oldest living male at which village affairs and family disputes deliberated upon as in a court of law. I recall how on one occasion. After a party to one dispute had made one too many appeals to Jesus Christ to be his witness as to the truth of what he was saying, my father's elder brother, Uncle, Uncle Akimbei, suddenly exclaimed, Ewoni Jesu Christi yiti wonkwe, che okitubukwani won bisi ni. This translates to who is this Jesus Christ that you keep calling? Was he born in Okitipupa? This incident stirred my curiosity as to the drivers of the foreign religious influences on my people. It emerged in the course of the research 
that a significant number of the colonial officers have been sons of clergymen. An interesting fact in itself, which becomes all the more significant because one of the key challenges to the authority of uh, the sons came from the interest in Western education, which the fathers had stimulated in the natives in the course of their evangelism. My research on the arrival of Christianity in Nigeria was to lead me to the realization that the secondary school which I attended in London, Highbury, Highbury Grove Boys Secondary School in Highbury, Hillington, stood on land which had belonged to the church, Missionary Society, CMS, which in 1830s had spearheaded the push of Christianity into what was to become Nigeria. The first CMS training college had been opened in Ivory in 1825 as the Ivory Missionary College. The Ivory Center, formerly the Foreign Mission Club, which was established in 1893 to provide accommodation to missionaries and Christian ministers in training, is still situated at Aberdeen Park, which backs onto the old school complex. I recall how, as schoolboys, we used to see the nuns in their habits, the priests in their dog collars, and various other pious looking people. Crisis, I mean, sorry, crisscrossing from Aberdeen Park to Ivory Fields without ever appreciating the significance of the location of Christianity in Africa with some other members of my family being Muslims, and with the sound of the daily call to prayer in the vicinity of Omididon Street, Isaleko, downtown Lagos. During the one year that I lived there with relatives, having imprinted in itself on my memory, I wanted an understanding of, the how, of how this faith from Arabia at first entered and then spread its reach across Nigeria. Above all, I was curious to discover how the fourth line between the two faiths came run through the center of the country so perfectly horizontally. My reflection on all these issues began in earnest in the course of my attendance at the Nigerian Law School in Victoria Island, Lagos. During the 1985-1986 academic year, following my call to the English bar, this was a period of transition for the country. The military regime of General Muhammadu Bari and Major Tunde Idiagmo had just been overthrown in August 1985, and General Ibrahim Abangeda had taken over. I wanted to understand why democracy had failed so badly in Nigeria and also the nature and origins of military rule in the country. I will take a tea break because that's a, a bit of a long bridge, you will say. And to every one of you who is still here or stumbling on this, this is us reading A Fatherless People, uh, a piece of work done by Delio. And this is just uh, the introduction to the real work from the what motivated the, the writer, the publisher, to go deeper into what we are about to see as uh, the history, our history. Okay, for clarity, yeah. So thank you so much uh, once again for joining me. So let us continue. In fact, I'm going to put on a. Uh, just to be sure that uh, everything is indeed, eh? you need to let me know if I am not reading too fast for you, okay? Because that's so important. It's like listening to a radio podcast, you know, like it's just like, it must be redeeming. If you want me to put the sound, I can actually get one up. I'm talking about like in sound, like that's going to be like a Anyway, you need to share the broadcast as well. All right, let's see. Let's see if that does make any. You it. Right. 
that can leave a sort of acoustic tune like that behind while I read. So I'm going to read, and you are going to you're going to tell me like if it is now. Uh, my you please remove it, right? Hmm? Thank you so much. Uh, that Azan Miga. Somebody says here. Yeah. Uh, let me put out quickly. Mr. Mayegu is very political. Our offense looking for your help in. In this situation we are, half of bread is not. Okay. I'm trying to understand this. Okay. Uh, Muhammad. Okay. You know something that is this, Muhammad. You have to do a bit of a uh, background check. It is. Uh, excuse me, tell me please if you think that sound is kind of all right like that, or it should be like that. Like that. You know? So you can find the book online. I believe you can find it on uh, Amazon. I do not know if uh, the, you can find this on Amazon uh, just like any book or any company. Oh, this was uh, ordered okay. and it got delivered here yeah. uh, in Scotland. Okay. But let's continue. We, we only have just maybe another, uh, let's say, two hours, by the way, uh, to get through this. And we are still at the introduction. So please let me know if the, okay, the sound should be lower, right? So sorry, I have to be asking because I prefer doing this. So you are the ones who are going to be consuming this, okay? So it can just be like a solo sound behind, I mean, background sound like that. Uh, and I'm not even trying to sleep. Let's try another sound. How is that? That's uh, okay, Let's leave it at the other sound, okay? So thank you very much. Uh, the sound has been reduced. Let me know if it is perfect for you. Continue. And the moment you all feel like that's perfect, I can mute the sound. I won't hear it. But whenever we are reading, the stage we leave it is going to be where it's going to stay at. Okay? And it will actually be interesting. So let me read. And you now tell me, all right? If you think uh, it is perfect, right? And it's just coming from loud. And also, please let me know. Uh, if I am reading too fast, normally I not to read too fast. Sometimes I may just about that. Please let me know that too. So let's continue. From the perspective of uh, the publisher, a fatherless people, you know, a fatherless uh, people. Let's continue. Somebody said that the sound is breaking. No, it's not. It is actually programmed that way. You know, up, down, and up. Yeah, but it's just in there and you'll be hearing it but you won't be able to really but when i read they just rhyme at some point okay so uh, thank you so much uh, for joining me as you are joining uh, you should share it this is my uh you know sharing with us uh this a fatherless people by delio a piece of art a piece of that you believe give us an insight into uh, more or less like who we are uh, than the dead one they have foisting or not set today. Remember that. In November 1995, a public hanging of the Obu activist, poet, and playwright Ken Sarowiwa was carried out. The hanging insistence of General Sonia Bacha in contemptuous disregard international pleas clemency. The oil deposit in Sarawiwa's Niger Delta region is what Nigeria's modern wealth is built upon and the UK's Shell Petroleum PLC is the main uh, hang on, yeah, is the main foreign oil operator region. I wanted to understand the politics of the country. The colonization of one people by another is engendered 
and sustained by complexes of superiority and inferiority. Like many myths, once such complexes have taken hold of human consciousness, it requires superhuman effort for them to be dislodged as intellectuals and historians begin to construct works of apparent easy upon these often dubious foundations. The following passage from the memoirs of Sir Brian Sherwood Smith, last British governor of northern Nigeria, is a case point. In quotes, Sherwood wrote, talking about the days when the ritual consumption of human flesh was a part of their daily life. Food was then I mean, desperately scarce, and the maintenance of the aged and infirm who could no longer hunt the farm was more than the community, more than the community contrived, except for the few whose acquaintance with the supernatural made them value. The aged, it was conveniently believed were prone to possessions by evil spirits which would prey upon their fellows. Such as these, once identified, were put to the sacrifice and consumed. Over venturesome travelers from other parts and the victims of intertribal warfare met a like fate. In fact, here, where we were sitting, it told me, was the site of the sacrificial altar. As I displayed interest, the old men, their tongues loosened by palm wine, began to describe in grisly detail exactly how these things had reached. The persons of the condemned were secured, aired downward between two upright stakes, their limbs spread eagled, beneath them burned a slow, smoky fire around in anticipation squatted the elders each with his back against an upright slab locked in the position to which his status entitled him as life passed boiling palm oil was introduced into a book i had heard in the colonial governor's account of events that were supposed to have taken place in the lifetime of my grandfather made me uncomfortable. It left me wondering how much of this was true rather than the product of a myth and literary license. In today's parlance, fake news. The instinctive skepticism, skepticism that I felt over the account was reinforced by a documentary program that I watched in England, which featured an upside-down crucifixion during the time of the Druids in Celtic Britain, which bore a striking resemblance to the method of ritual, ritual sacrifice that Mr. Sherwood Smith was attributing to Nigeria. Yet, ever a man of Sherwood Smith's experience in, experience in Nigeria wrote in his memoirs, not be lightly dismissed. This memo is published in 1969 as the Biafra War drew to a close. It has been amongst the leading reference materials for many commentaries at the time on the causes of that bloody conflict, in which over two million are said to have died from a combination of machetes, bullets, bombs, and starvation. All the same. I had my own experiences to draw upon, having been raised in the village by my grandmother during my early years with the extended influence on Akinbeni and other relation, I mean, relations. While I could accept that there would sometimes be the hot character or two, whose habit was always to drink Okogoro excess, I also knew that persons of such disposition were never known. Studies of reliable 
communal history. More than anything else, it was Sherwood Smith's improbable tale. Eh? Though solemnly told of cannibalism and the eating of the aged, in the days when the ritual consumption of human flesh was a part of their daily life, that steered me into these issues. It would be naive to deny that in times of war, native fighters might not burn the corpse of their slain foe, and as a demonstration of fearlessness with their people and utter ruthlessness, their enemies eat some part of the flesh of their slain opponent. However, this tale of cannibalism as a habit involving roasting of human flesh with the addition of spices, one of scarcity of meat, and the raving for flesh, as the governor relate, is quite another thing altogether. In any case, I had always thought, I have always thought it strange that it was in Africa, a part of the world which in the mind of the average Westerner is more known for its seeming wildlife than its people. That it was said that humans consumed human flesh out of meat, it was ironic because it was, after all, eh, the abundance of the blessings from nature's person which God had chosen to lavish on the land had induced Sherwood Smith's government to first send its explorers, David Livingston, Mongo Parks, etc., to scout and recall, I mean, I record the nature and, ex I mean, yeah, and the extent of these blessings. Before the traders and administrators then came out to harvest the bounty, repatriation back to their homeland, the straight-talking Lord Frederick Dad, the chief British architect of Nigeria, whose wife gave the country his name, admitted this much in his own memoirs. Frederick Dad, the tropics are the heritage of mankind. Talking about Nigeria, the tropics are heritage and, and neither on the, I mean, on the one as the suzerain of power a right to their exclusive exploitation you know? on the other hand have the races which inhibit them a right to deny their bounties to those who need them the colonialist Sherwood Smith claimed that in the Fendish practice that he was reporting, elderly were preyed upon was even more outlandish. Me as one who had spent his early years amongst villagers who, though rendered poor and miserable by the mismanagement of successive uh, governments, nature's bounty, still held to the custom of tending farms, neighbors were too sick, toy and of sending their young children to take meals across to the infirm in the long-established tradition of care in the community. My interest in how Nigeria took the wrong turn led to an introduction to one of elder statesmen whose political career straddled uh, the before and the after of Nigerian independence, who was then living abroad in exile from Abacha regime. Chief and the now significance in the Nigeria stories testified to by the fact that his fight to Britain for refuge from charges of high treason in 1963 on a first round of exile in the wake of Nigeria's immediate independence crisis filled the pages of the answer, I mean, answered court on the UK Parliament's proceedings, such was the political storm that. We over the extradition of this small yet extraordinary man, that it menaced the stability of the conservative government of the day and contributed to its fall, despite the fact that, in the end, it only granted the extradition request on the strict condition that it was executed. It's just that December 2010, suitable being covered in the very page. The living British newspapers while its service was 
in Westminster, Westminster Raga Cathedral. Enauro was of the royal line in the kingdom of Benin, with which the royal court of Portugal first established diplomatic relations through the Portuguese explorers in the course of their quest for the new sea route to Asia in the mid 15th century. One of the many historical anecdotes that I picked up from him was one which had been passed down as to how the Portuguese had been extremely civil and respectful during these first visits. What I have never been able to work out is, and now right said, was caused, I mean, so what caused them to change? Was the question he asked repeatedly in his closing years. According to Enao, the first contact that the Western people have with the people of East Nigeria, the Portuguese established a diplomatic relationship with the Portuguese kingdom. And he said they were so sick and respectful that it didn't last long. His orders were gone. Okay. So yes, being one of the first of a new generation of Nigerians in the diaspora, who had been, had been through the same primary, secondary, and university education experience as the colonial administrators, among the same opportunities for self-education that survive in the West of us. I had more than casual interest in the character of this young Nigerian. Laws as such an age. Now, they are out, I mean, the anti work is defined by successive Nigerian leaders. The process of dedication was captured in the words of Malcolm uh, Margaret, it is said, went out to the empire in the 1920s. It's a memoir, I said. From the moment of landing in Tobombo, I was made conscious of my status as a Sahib. It was like suddenly inheriting a peerage, or peerage rather, a peerage, and being addressed as my lord, just by virtue of being English and white. If you went to buy a ticket at a rail, I mean, railway station, it made way for you. Similarly, in a shop, it was very insidious. At first, I found it embarrassing and distasteful. Then, though, I continued to ridiculate. I came to count upon receiving special treatment. Finally, when for some reason it was not accorded, there was an impulse to become sulky and irritated. From that, it was but a small step to shouting and insisting as in the days of I, this of Raj, I saw happen often. Why some went in search of an image and the which was testifying, others were motivated by a sort of missionary idealism of the Victorian era. Even in England, I had the good fortune of speaking with one or two of the main players on the Nigerian colonial scene, in the course of which I was able to tease out some reflections. In one of the darkest moments of the country's distant political I had set out to bring together uh, as many of them as I could uh, for an on-camera discussion with Enahu. The topic was to have been how the Nigerians miss the road to East and Britain being famous for the vibrancy of its networks. It was not long before I had drawn up an impressive list, which included John Hillary Smith, CB, who had been Deputy Secretary to Nigeria's Prime Minister at Independence, Abubakar Tafawa Balewa. He was, in fact, still in post on, I mean, up until the time of Balewa's death in the first military coup in January 1966. Fortunately, Dialogue for posterity between the old communist and the old nationalist never happened. There was, however, one former colonial officer with whom I enjoyed a record 
Sadun Patan that he had served in East Africa and Nigeria was of little consequences in terms of understanding the characters of the cadets. It may, in fact, have accounted for the alone being prepared to engage on these issues. After receiving my from Nigeria, which the Economic Research Council had published in 2002, in the course of our correspondence, we provided the insights, perspective of the administrator. Now, here is what uh, Don Pat told her. Uh, one characteristic of colonial rule was that whilst we were attached to our work, we were detached from any riding and mountains. After 50, 60 years of colonialism, it was possible for Nigerians to accept decisions and advice from an alien state officer, for example, knowing that he was detached. Whereas it was later not possible acceptable from Nigerians with their nationalities. And this potential of internal frictions were concealed under the colonial umbrella and expressed that loudly as nowhere was this scenario clearer than the army. The Nigerian army could be clear to a colonial government because in the context of local nationalities, it was neutral. But after independence, these nationalities within the army developed national doubts or reverted to them. I think it's probable that because these national loyalties were contained several decades, the colonial government of the day overlooked the potential of the construction so that the independence constitution was too optimistic. I think we were all over optimistic about the state and did not anticipate local frictions arising after independence. Although there was certain evidence of this in Nigeria, the state had, the state had functioned under colonial rule and there seemed to be, I mean, to be no reason why this should not continue after independence. But in reality, Nationalism was primarily a response to representing a wish for independence. There was no underlying sense of national unity in most cases. Thus, Tanzania and Zambia are perhaps exceptions. Primary loyalty was to family, clan, and tribe, not to the country. In Tanzania, even the district could be an alien concept. But what saved the day here was that there were no serious tribal rivalries. Neither was any tribal group sufficiently large to inspire to dominate. Which leads me on to the big men of politics. This is only a theory of mine, but I wonder if the origins go back to pre-colonial African societies. I know that there were many varieties of social structure. But the shift in one form or another was a common feature. Whether elected or hereditary, in a pastoral agricultural society, his duties and responsibilities were not onerous or complex, except, for example, in times of war or other crises, he governed in conformity with tradition. So decision making was not difficult. He governed in conformity with tradition. Again, so he had a rule book, as it were. The rewards were proportionally modest. Status, limited power, respect, and more of everything that everyone else had. More food, milk, beef, uh, sorry, meat, wives, perhaps more cattle, more clothes, and better accommodation. Quantitatively, better off than his people. But quantitatively, not much different. No enhanced medical care, private jets, shopping at Arrods, etc. He remained very much in touch with his people and close to them. With the modern polit politicians, these links have been broken. 
And by misuse of about, sorry, by misuse of power, he has access to material rewards, which his people can only dream about. In fact, they are not his people. They are simply a means whereby he is enabled to better. One can perhaps argue from this that this process reflects my earlier remark about loyalty to family coming first rather than loyalty to country. It could explain what one might call the acceptance of phase of corruption. What it does explain what one might call sorry, what it does. I'm gonna say what it does not rather explain is the excess. By all means, look after your family, but this does not require a fleet of Mercedes, a castle in Germany, shopping trips to New York, and a bank account of billions in Switzerland. Which brings us round question. Why do people vote for candidates who repeatedly let them down? Let them down. Is it gullibility? Naivety? A triumph of hope over experience? Or because of local loyalties rather than appraiser of the big picture? Voting for personalities rather than policies clearly doesn't work. Going back in time, in traditional society, we are chiefs by choosing. People clearly voted for the personality. But the personality was someone who they knew, who lived close by. Policy was determined by the tribal rule book and not in this field. In the circumstances of the time, this arrangement probably worked very well. And if the chief did not come up to scratch, he could be deposed, exiled, or executed as custom required. Incidentally, in referring to corruption in African affairs, I am aware that it also exists in this country. A rich country can afford it, a poor country cannot. And it is the exception rather than the rule. Looking back, it was only in the 1870s that recruitment to our senior civil service was by public examination rather than patronage. And that commissions and provisions in the army ceased to be by purchase and bribery. The mandate itself against the backdrop, end of quote, by the uh, against the backdrop of this introspective, this former colonial officer, we can begin in Nigeria to start where we should very. All I have read to you all this while, they are just introduction. History of Nigeria. There is some existence before Nigeria. They have existed centuries before the colonial thoughts and their local collaborators decided to enslave our people for their own personal gain. Say, thank you so much uh, once again. Uh, I want to quickly check something. If, uh, the, if you think uh, the audio is a little bit off, eh, that's one reason why I want to also sort of uh, fix Usually, it shouldn't be, okay? Because it's pretty much like uh, the same position that uh, it's always been. Of course, I was a little bit far from uh, the other microphone as well. So, yeah. I don't know. I think it should be better. Let me know, sir. Just reason. Eh? Uh, the microphone is a little bit off, you said, right? Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's start again. I really do wish uh, it is not that bad, okay? Because normally, I'll try something now. See, if that stays still and it should work, 
okay so we have uh, some important dates here listed uh, by this author and i'm also going to uh, read them out just for the record especially for those who are going to see this video and also when this video is uh, uh you know caught into art or easy sharing and consumption and all that okay so let's hope that the audio works better now yeah okay somebody said there uh, right it was only breaking like back and forth again sorry about that it's normally uh i wouldn't stay that bad i mean much like that i won't, I won't back that much okay or now there is this uh, chronology uh left by the author okay the chronology means the events in history that we should just be aware of including when uh they finally uh, captured nigeria listen you might need to probably get this book as well just for your own keep and so when we start reading it proper eh, you will be able to maybe even read with us like that okay so i'm so sorry that it's been yeah it's been a little bit off by the way okay but if it is better now let me now read this chronology and dates these dates you do not have to know all of them but i believe i can put all of these in about maybe five ten minutes video. okay let's start these are important dates until the day that the colonialist the slave trade the colonialist the independence the and all of that today's nigeria before nigeria so april 19 i mean 1775 u.s war independence begins in november on the 7th of november 1775 british proclamation pledging freedom for slaves joining british forces on november 4th 1776 U.S. Declaration of Independence. Then okay. on seven, I mean, that same date, right? I mean, so that same uh, November, I'm going to, November uh, 1784, Rhode Island passes law liberating all newborn slaves. In 1783, again, right? Just a little bit roll back. William Pitt, the younger, becomes British Prime Minister. On the 2nd of May, 1787, Committee for the Abolition of the Slave Trade is formed under William Wilberforce. On June 9, 1788, the Association for the Promotion of Discovery of the Interior Parts of Africa was formed. On the 12th of April, 1799, church missionary society established you see all these things they are they are it's listed on in this uh a chronology right they all have a role to play in the formation of uh the would be country nigeria like about 100 years later i mean almost 300 years later sorry 200 years rather 1900 so to what will later happen 200 years later that's why you need to Pay attention to this uh you know kind of date okay right so on the 29th of may 1804 fulani jihad against Aousa nations Aousa, Aousa nation begins on the i mean sorry uh may 1814 napoleon bonaparte bonaparte was defeated on the First of uh, November, eighteen fourteen. Yeah, uh, Congress of uh, Vienna was formed on the first of October, eighteen eighteen to eighteen thirty two. Right, Congress. Sorry, Congress of Actu Chapelle was formed. Richard Landal identified source of the River Niger. So, by the 18th of November, 1830, Palmerston becomes Foreign Minister of Britain. 
on August 28, 1833, abolition of slave trade. Slave trade was abolished, like started. By 1837, post publication of Thomas Powell Buxton's The African Slave Trade and Its Remedy. By 1841, Niger Expedition. By 1845, Soko dethrones King Akintoyi of Lagos. By July 1846, the beginning of uh, Abe Okuta CMS mission. By December 25, 1851, the British bombardment of Lagos. By 1854, the British deposed King Pepu of Bonny. By 1858, the British colonization of India. By 1859, Henry Townsend publishes first newspaper in Nigeria. By 1860, the beginning of Yoruba Civil War. August 6, 1861, British declare Lagos as a colony. 1873, British war against the Ashantes. By 1884, the Berlin Conference. Same 1884, the Maxim gun invented. By June 5, 1885, wow. 1884, 1884. So I was born 100 years after the Berlin Conference. Yet they shared after that. I was born 100 years after that. I was born 1984. So 1884 is significant. I will put that in my memory tape right now. I've been talking about Berlin Conference, Berlin Conference. I've been so specific about uh, uh, the date and all that, right? Great. By June 5, 1885, British declare oil rivers protectorate. By July 1886, grant of the Royal Charter to Niger Company. By September 23, 1886, end of Yoruba Civil War. September 19, 1887, British depose. Jaja of Okoku. January 18, 1896, British Treaty with Egba confirming independence of the Egba United Kingdom. By 1894, British depose and deport Nana of the Shekiri. By January 22, 1895, brass men destroyed Royal Niger Company depot at Akasa. February 22nd, 1895 to Akasa Massacre, British dethroned Koko of Nene, I mean Nembe, or Nembe. By January 27, 1897, British conquest of Bida. By January 6, I mean February 16, 1897, British conquest of Ilorin. February 18, 1897, British conquest of Bini. January 1, 1900, Charter of Royal Niger Company revoked and protectorates of Northern and Southern Nigeria proclaimed. At the same January 1900, French conquest of Bono. February 3rd, sorry, February 3rd, 1903, British conquest of Kano. That same February 1903, British conquest of Shokoto. That same February 1903, British expedition against Tifi people. By October 16, 1905, British partitioning of Bengal, India. By February 26, 1906, amalgamation of Lagos Colony and Southern Nigeria under Governor Walter Hegerton. By February 1906, that same February 1906, I'm oh, sorry, September rather, September 1906. Freddy Lugard resigned as High Commissioner of Northern Nigeria. That same September 1906, oil, explore, I'm sorry, oil, uh, oil exploration 
again in southern Nigeria. How many of you remember when they started talking about uh, 1957? Oil was discovered in Oloibiri. You see this history? You are going to know where that oil exploration started in Nigeria. And I can tell you, even though it is not Oloibiri, history, oh, well, let's continue, Sha. September 1906, oil exploration begins in southern Nigeria. By November 1908, oil production began in southern Nigeria. By 1911, November, publication of uh, E.D. Morel's uh, Nigeria, its people and its problems. By May 1912, Frederick Lugard recalled to effect amalgamation of uh, southern Nigeria and northern Nigeria. By January 1st, 1914, the amalgamation of the northern and the southern protectorate of Nigeria. January 18, 1914, World War I ends. By September 1, 1914, Lugard revokes Eba independence and amalgamates Eba with Nigeria. By January 8, 1918, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson proclaimed his 14 point and the creation of the League of Nations. By January 13, 1918, a bar and Owu war against British rule begins. By January 22, 1918, British defeat of a bar and Owu. By November 1918, World War One ends. By January 28, 1918, Basel Treaty imposing war reparation on Germany. On August 8, 1919, the call and retirement of Frederick Lugard as Governor General of Nigeria. August 8, 1919, also, Hugh Clifford becomes Governor of, Gen uh, of Nigeria. In that same August, 1920, sorry, in uh, 1922, Clifford Constitution. 1923, Herbert Macaulay forms Nigeria National Democratic Party, NNDP, the first political party in Nigeria. In 1923, Frederick Lugard publishes the dual mandate. In 1923, Adolf Hitler published Mein By November 13, 1925, Graham Thompson becomes governor of Nigeria. In 1929, the Great Depression begins. December 1929, British massacre of protesting women in eastern Nigeria. January 17, 1931, Donald Cameron becomes governor of Nigeria. March 4, 1933, Nandi Azikiwe's New Year Resolution. August the 2nd, 1934, Adolf Hitler becomes Chancellor of Nazi Germany. November 1934, Aziki will complete his tour of Eastern Nigeria. November 1, 1935, Bernard Bodilon becomes Governor of Nigeria. 1937, Bodilon publishes his memorandum on the future political development of Nigeria. In July 1937, Azikiwe returns to Nigeria from Ghana and launches West African Pilot newspaper. October 1938, Nigerian Youth Movement wins Lagos election. Good, yeah, Nigerian Youth Movement against the and it's one election in Lagos. Interesting. April 1, 1939, Odilon partitions Southern Nigeria. September 1939, World War II begins. May 10, 1940, Winston Churchill becomes British Prime Minister. August 14, 1941, U I mean, USA President Roosevelt and British Prime Minister Churchill issue the Atlantic Charter. And December 1941, USA enters World War II against Nazi Germany. And in 1942, H.O. Davis resigns from Nigeria Youth Movement. 
December 1943, Arthur Richard becomes governor of Nigeria. 1943, formation of Igbo State Union. 1944, Azikiwe establish, establishes National Council of Nigeria and the Cameroons, NCNC. April 12, 1945, U.S. President Roosevelt dies. May 7, 1945, World War II ends. June 1945, General Strike. July 26, 1945, Clement Attu, or Attlee, becomes pri British Prime Minister. January 1, 1946, Richard Constitution formalizing three regions, published and regional elections organized. May 1946, NCNC tour of Nigeria. January 1947, Richard Constitution comes, to, comes into effect. June 1947, Richard, uh, sorry, June 1947, NCNC tour of Nigeria, rather NCNC delegation to London. August 15, 1947, India granted independence. February 5, 1948, John McPherson becomes Nigeria governor. May 14, 1948, creation of the state of Israel. May 1948, Nigeria, Nigerianization Commission established. June 1948, Obafemi Awolowo forms a bear or Dudua. Number 18, 1948, that's uh, 1949, rather, Eva Valley Massacre in Enugu. January 1950, National Conference held in Ibadan. April 1950, Zikist movement outlawed. June 29, 1951. Sorry, November 1951. But it's going to be McPherson now. So, yes, June 29, 1951, McPherson Constitution. March 21, 1951, Awolowo forms Action Group as a political party. October 1, 1951. Northern People's Congress formed as a political party. October 26, 1951, Winston Churchill returned as British Prime Minister. November 1951, Regional Assembly elections. January 29, 1952, first sitting of the new House of Representatives. That same 1952, first census. July 20, uh, 23rd, 1952, Colonel Abdul Nasir staged military coup in Egypt. January 20, 1953, White Ezinoa becomes President of the United States of America. March 31, 1953, Action Group motion demanding self governance. In 1956, May 1953, Arab riots and killings in Kano. May 1953 as well, London Constitutional Conference. October 1, 1954, Itutin Constitution. October 1, 1954, Southern Cameroon becomes a separate region within Southern Nigeria. November 1954, elections to Federal House of Representatives. April 6, 1955, Anthony Eden becomes British Prime Minister. June 15, 1955, James Robertson becomes Governor General of Nigeria. December 1955, Aro Smith comes to Nigeria. January 1956, Queen Elizabeth II visits Nigeria. May 1956, Western Region Elections. July 26, 1956, Nasir nationalizes Suez, I mean Suez Canal. October 27. 1956, Israel invades Egypt. Six-day arab israeli war begins, and British and France occupy the Canal Zone. November 1956, Northern Region Elections. November 6, 1956, ceasefire in Arab-Israeli war. December 26, 1956, last British troop retire from the, can I mean, the Canal Zone. January 1957, 
Oster Sutton reports into African Continental Bank published. January 10, 1957, Harold Macmillan becomes British Prime Minister. March 7, sorry, March 1957, Eastern Region and Southern Cameroon elections. March 7, 1957, Ghana granted independence. September 29, 1957, Lancaster House Constitutional Conference. August 8, 1957, Western and Eastern Regions become self-governing. August 8, 1957, Tafaba, Tafaba Lewa appointed to Office of Prime Minister. July 1958, Willink Willink Commission report published. March 1959, Northern Region becomes self-governing. December 1959, Independence Election. December 1959, Harold Macmillan delivers Wind of Change speech in South Africa. August 1960, TV's uprising. October 1, 1960, Nigeria granted independence. October 1, 1960, NCP-NC-NC -NC -NC Alliance government take office with Alewa as Prime Minister. November 16, 1960, Unamdi Azikiwe replaces James Robinson as Governor General of Nigeria. December 14, 1960, United Nations Resolution 1514 passed, proclaiming the end of colonialism. February 1961, plebiscites in Northern and Southern Cameroon. February 1962, census. May 29, 1962, state of emergency declared in Western Nigeria. October 1, 1963, Nigeria becomes a republic. October 1, 1963, Unamdi Azikiwe becomes president of Nigeria. July 1964, Awolowo jailed on treason charges. February 1965, Major General Welby Everett replaced as Commander-in-Chief of the Nigerian Army by Thomas Agui in Rossi. October 1965, Regional Assembly Elections. January 15, 1966, First Military Coup. February 27, I'm sorry, February 23rd, 1966, Declaration of Niger Delta Republic. February, I'm sorry, May 24, 1966, Proclamation of Unification Decree, number 34, creating United Nigeria. May 29, 1966, first, first round of programs against Eagles in Northern Nigeria. I'll take a tea break and I'll say something about that. Do you know that May 29, that the military chose for the Democracy Day in Nigeria where they transfer from one government to another in Nigeria. It's actually a celebrated day of program against the Eagles in uh, Northern Nigeria. It was the day, you know what is called a program? It's a day where everything Igbo or anything Igbo is to be destroyed and they killed and killed. Listen to that again, oh, that's part of our, that's part of your history. May 29, 1966, first round of programs against Eagles. Two months later, Erosi was uh, taken and killed and in a revenge coup. So the first reaction to killing the Eagles and being blamed for the coup, I'm expecting a copy of that uh, book by we struck. Everyone who participated in school in Nigeria. I'm expecting the book in the next 48 hours. Finish this first. Okay. So May 29, 1966 was an Igbo program day for the Fulani uh, Sharia North. Eh? They chose that day as the day that will remain indelible. In like, you know what I mean? Instead of you reading about May 29 as the day they killed Igbo in the northern Nigeria, eh? you only remember May 29 as the day the three hundred over power civilians. Remember that. I'll continue. History. August, uh, sorry, 
July 29, 1966, counter coup and second round of program against Eagles in northern Nigeria. August 3, 1966, Awolowo and Enahoro released from prison. July 29, 1966, third round of program, programs against Igbos in northern Nigeria. January 1967, Aburi Accord. May 27, 1967, Decree dividing Nigeria into 12 states. May 30, 1967, Declaration of Biafra. July 1967, Biafra War Begins. August 27, 1969, British House of Commons Debate on Biafra. May 30, 1969, American student Bruce Merrock self-immolates in protest against Biafra War. January 11, 1970, Ponelojuku escapes from Biafra. January 15, 1970, Biafra surrender. October 6, 1973, Arab-Israeli war and onset of oil boom. July 29, 1975, Major General Gowon overthrown in a military coup by Buritala Ahmed. February 13, 1976, Muritala Muhammad assassinated and Ulushe Gumbasunjo becomes military ruler. That same 1976, decision taken to move Nigeria capital from Lagos to Abuja. 1979, new constitution dividing Nigeria into 19 states and replacing parliamentary system with presidential system. Obasanjo did that. October 1979, return to civilian rule with Shehu Shagari as president. In 1983, new presidential election returned Shagari to power. December 31, 1983, Shagari government overthrown by military coup and General Buhari becomes military ruler. August 27, 1985, Buhari overthrown in a military coup by General Ibrahim Babangida. April 22, 1990, a coup by Major Gideon, I mean Gideon Oka. June 12, 1993, presidential elections. June 23, 1993, Babangida announced election results. August 26, 1993, Babangida forced aside and Ernest Shonekon appointed interim president. November 18, 1993, General Sonia Abacha removes Shonekon from power. May 1994, the National Democratic Coalition at Deco formed. June 23, 1994, Moshe Dabiola declared himself winner of the aborted June 12 elections and president and is jailed. June 1994, Abasha convinced National Constitutional Conference. By November 10, 1995, Abasha regime hangs Ogun activist Ken Sarawiwa. June 4, 1996, Abiola's wife, Kudra Abiola, assassinated. June 8, 1998, Abacha dies in office. July 7, 1998, Abiola dies in prison. And 1999, national elections. May 29, 1999, General Olushe Sonjo becomes president. October 26, 1999, Governor of Zamfara in northern Nigeria announces plan to enforce Sharia criminal law. November 20, 1999, Obasanjo government attacks and destroy Odi town in southern Nigeria. November 23, 2002, is world pageant riot and killings in Kaduna. March 2003, US and British government launch invasion of Iraq. May 29, 2003, Obasanjo returned to power for second term as president. May 29, 2007, Umaru Yaradua becomes president. November 23, 2009, Lord Jonathan takes over from Yara Dua as president. November 23, 2011, Good Luck Jonathan becomes president after winning presidential elections. May 13, to, I mean, May, sorry, May 2013, Operation Restore Order launched against Boko Haram. March 17, 2014, Good Luck Jonathan convinced National Conference Dialogue. April 14, 2014, announcement of Boko Haram 
kidnap of Chibok girls. And that is now going us waiting for the time to eat us chapter. Slavery. Slavery's end. Organizations begin. So that's what we're going to take on uh, the next time. And, uh, you know, which is going to be like the preparing day. They call this one, uh, call this particular one intro. Intro into uh, the uh, book, a fatherless uh, people. And this is going to touch on a lot of things. And if you should have the time, I'm going to be reading them uh, in the afternoon. So I'm going to be waiting uh, later. It as well. Here you get history. History that they do not want you to know. How has it been so easy? Um, manipulating generation, generation, generation after generation uh, in order to keep existing uh, in a contraption that is uh, more or less like Put together to work against uh, against them. In a circle. So check it. Uh, my audio, my microphone, right? a little bit uh, dodgy. Sometimes it uh, has to be charged as well. Okay, so thank you so much. Let me know if you think this is going to be an interesting uh, sort of uh, you know, moment. That's modern uh, happy uh, 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 I mean, out of as well. Make sure you have enough. Make sure you have enough. Can I trust this one? I do have a caller. Hello, man. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you, my ego, very clearly. Loud and clear. Okay, great, Baba. How are you? Very good, my ego. This is Olu from Canada. Saolu, how are you today? How are you? Thank you for, for the readout. Um, really do appreciate it. I enjoyed it. We haven't really delved into it. We soon delve into it. Yeah, I, I, I realize that. And, and you see, this is, this is the power of um, technology. Some of these stories and things we've seen that we should have learned in our history, I mean, the social studies that they abolished, um, we seem to be, I mean, learning about them now and and I mean, that, thank, thank, thank God for the work that people like you are doing and, and other bloggers, you know, um, talking about your, our history, Yoruba history, our individual histories in, in that place called Nigeria. Um, I mean, I, I really do appreciate it. Um, I, I wish that the Awusa people too can more of them like that can come out and talk about their histories and I mean if all ethnic groups then we will begin to appreciate each other better. You know? I mean, I, I, I respect ourselves for and we know that's that right. The, so this uh that, that's right. all this identity crisis we really really need to do something. That's why you see Kalata. That's so right. Behind, telling them how your family is that, that's right that's right i mean even in america there's there's a lot we can learn from 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 even america especially the blacks when 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 they because they they under, underwent a, a particular i mean they, they they got their freedom in kind of stages when 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 those blacks when when they came when they even took them from africa to to america I, I, I was watching a documentary. They would burn, they would they would wrap clothes around their eyes, so that they don't, so that when they get to America and they want to run away, they are not able to trace their back, their path back to their roots. That that was what how, how far this thing went. And when when even when eventually when they got freedom, they, they, you you still had stages where they were told you can't you can't watch. You can't sleep in the same hotel with a white guy. You can't be in the same restaurant with a white guy. You can't be in the same school bus. You can't be in the same school. Your, your kids can't be in the same school. And then their forefathers fought for freedom for, for these black 
people and we, they seem to have equality. And at a point, even even the whites, they had to apologize. You know, the, the current they, they had to apologize like, sorry, we, you know, right. for, 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 for what their forefathers did. And and even today, you would, you would see some descendants of slaves and descendants of slave owners where they are bringing them together. I mean, trying to repair the, you know, bring that unity and repair the damage that was done. But we are ethnic groups and, and some people want to act like we, we are conquered. They still want to keep us conquered, keep other minority groups in that place conquered. When we can all live on the same basis of equality, fairness and justice, and still provide, I mean, I, I, I don't get it. I don't, I, don't, I don't really get it. I don't know why, I mean, I and, and people who claim... So embedded in us. The way that uh, not greed or selfishness. Yeah, we are more loyal to family than loyal to uh, country or neighbor. Like he put it uh, earlier, right? Or, yes. It's a shame, Baba, honestly. Because, I mean, how, why, why I, I don't just... believe that uh, what we have done to ourselves, you know, during the colonization, right? So it's. Yes. And, you have and, I, and, I, and I. And I. Yes. And I and I and I and I and I'm so happy that our generation, our our current generation and the younger ones are are fighting back. They are using they're using technology, we're using online um connection to fight educate ourselves and fight back this demon that has possessed that so country so and many so many misinformation, misrepresentations, and so many people have kind of accepted since they have no alternative. They kind of have accepted that yeah. we need to change some of those things. Some of what they have told our people is what they believe, right? And they've concluded that's that right. there's no point in trying to change it since they said that's what we have to do. That, that's right. and, and I hope more of this can, can continue, and, and, I, and I'm sure someday we will, we will overcome. I mean, if the likes of Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, no, they were black. It wasn't even their land, but they, they kind of believed that, you know what, well, you guys took, brought us from, from yeah, our original home to this exactly. place. And you can't you can't treat us like we are less human than you. And they fought and they achieved it. So how much more people who, who live on their own land, their own heritage? I mean, I mean, you, you, like Nigerians have got to think. They've got to think. Thank you, so much. Thank you again, Mary. Says how old they have come. Okay, you two can be part of it. It's usually the uh, meeting. Uh, so that's what I can drop. This one is. Hello there, ma. Hello, my good general. Good morning. The African Wahala. How are you today? I am doing very well. Great. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for helping me begin my day with good information. It helped me refresh my information on a lot of things and I learned a lot. I think this content is absolutely great. The thing is, this type of content might not be financially rewarding because people would rather listen to comedy and you know stuff that makes them laugh. People just want to drown their sorrows. But this type of content is much more important and it is timeless. This is stuff that people would refer to in the next 30 years, 50 years. And we don't have a choice because a lot of us are in a position where we are not proud of our nation. I mean, Okay, then let me rephrase. We are not proud of our country because there is a difference between a nation and a country. And it's the same way, like the previous scholar said, Mr. Olu said, he was saying stuff about African Americans. You find it, you find a lot of those African Americans today, they don't even consider themselves as Africans. They would rather say that they are Native Americans. Yeah. You know, it's because nobody wants to be with the losing team. The only reason, it's a psychological thing. The only reason why these people don't want to associate with Africa is because 
for the most part, Africa is on the losing team, unfortunately. And that's the same way that we, that we found ourselves trapped in Nigeria. We don't want to associate with Nigeria because it's the losing team. So I really appreciate this content. I just called in to encourage you to, you know, do more of this whenever you have the opportunity. Yeah. And, and this is timeless. We would always refer to this when our kids are much older. A lot of us would send them to go watch these videos because people are lazy to read these days. It, it's, it's not that interesting to read, pick up a book and read or go on the internet. So when people come across these types of videos, they can educate themselves. So I appreciate it and I just call to encourage you to keep on doing it. Thank you, so Thank you my brother. <laughs> yes, sir. So again, like uh, the African Wahala said, right? Uh, content like this is more uh, available. It's meant to actually get a lot of people say, okay, I, I can sit down and I can pay this in this case. Yeah, please open that. See, right? And in most cases, if you actually really special, like you are listening with other people, it's a different one where people are reacting to it. Uh, so I'm so sorry. I don't know what uh, is somehow, uh, you know, not really working with this audio. It is not really coming out the way it should. Maybe it's just me trying to think. Let's hear from the uh, country emperor. You there? Ah, Sapa Malipo, my brother. Malipo, Sapa, brother. How are you today? Oh, I'm feeling good, feeling great. Good weekend, I don't productive know if, uh, weekend. You can hear me better, or if it is just uh, me that is struggling with. Uh, um, I can um, I can hear you very clearly, but there's some sort of a background music on your end. All right, that I can hear. Music. But I put that on because yeah. we were having, uh, you know, when we when I was reading. I'm going to take it off now. What about it? So it was meant to give uh, this background kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sort of yeah but the yeah. audio is kind of better out there do right yeah yeah the audio is better now right. um stick to that go on yeah man. yeah um um today's content is um very interesting um i agree with what uh, african uh the african wala my brother said um so i, I just called because the first caller mr olu uh he said um, the black Americans got their freedom in stages. <laughs> uh, that is actually very interesting because Nigerians have been conquered in stages as well. <laughs> you see, that's the irony. <laughs> that's the irony. And let me tell you how Nigerians have been conquered in stages. It started with Usman Dan for idiot, number one. Then Lord Lugard, number two. Then Christianity, number three. Then Islam, number four. Politics, number five. And uh, try and uh, what a tribal bigotry and financial economic hardship, the final stage. Because people in poverty. People who are worried about, I am a Christian, I am a Muslim. People worried, people that are worried about being Euro, I am a Yoruba man, I am an Igbo man. They can never be progressive, Mayeku. The reasons why the Black Americans have been progressive is because they were not worried about if they were Christians or Muslims. They were not worried about tribal bigotry. They realized that they had one enemy. And that was the slave masters. But don't get it twisted, Maegu. There were some house niggers. The house niggers wanted to keep the field niggers in slaves. You know, you know, you know what they say when they talk about being a house nigger. The people that worked for the slave masters. The, the, the exactly. The but if exactly, despite the fact that the black Americans had saboteurs among their midst. They gained freedom because they realized, most of them realized that the slave masters were their enemies. 
But Nigerians have several slave masters. So how can Nigerians be progressive, Mayugu? Religion is their slave master. Their politicians is their slave master. Their tribe is their slave master. Their family is their slave master. So how can Nigerians realize that? Exactly. Nigerians are serving too many masters. So how can they gain freedom? Now, um, I think African Wala said something that, that I want to correct. He said that the black Americans don't want to associate with Africa because they're on the losing side. The question is, why should black Americans associate with Africa? All they've known is, is America. That's all they've ever known. When, when the initial slaves came to America, their names was taken away from them. Your name is Toby. No, my name is, I've forgotten the name. What's the name of that movie? I think people need to go and watch that movie. I've forgotten the name. It's a classic slave movie. God, it escaped my mind. Yes, yes. That's one famous one too. A lot of slaves had their names and their language beaten away from them. And they kept on giving birth, giving birth. Their generations, their offspring, all they've known is, is America. That is why they fought for their equality, Marigo. So African Wala is wrong for him saying that they don't want to associate with, with, with Africa. No. There was never a reason for them to associate with Africa. All they've known is America, and they fought for it. So the Nigerians that are even on their own land, they are slaves in their own land, slave, serving different slave masters. Nigerians can't be free. They can only be free by blood, my ego. Do you know why? Because the black Americans were ready to shed blood for their freedom. The question is, are the zombies in Nigeria ready to shed their blood for their freedom? No, they are not. But they are ready to shed their blood for their Jews, for their imams, and for their politicians. My ego, last last, they go chop themselves, bro. The that is all I have. Yeah. That, that, that is all I have to say today. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And again, this content that you are doing, this trust me, you've gotten me very interested in this book. I'm going to look for this book sure. and read it myself because the, the, the first part that you have read is like, damn, I didn't know this. As in the British Empire, as they were conquering Nigeria, they were just conquering other places in succession. Like these guys were moving yeah, big. Point, yeah. Like it's crazy. Half of this old bro, Britain alone was controlling the half. Bro. America had to it, fight like, with them now, you don't know. Yeah, I know that. Fight fight no, no. Them, shoot themselves, fire, defeated see, them with see, 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 um, see, 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 my good, see, see, my good, the thing is that, America. see, 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 the thing is that, I understand that the British Empire conquered a lot of places. It is how they were moving, the dates, the timeline is just surprising how these guys we're really thirsty and greedy for power. It's man, this this man, this white people alone. What year we're going? <laughs> uh, our, our, our ancestors no stand any chance. We will not lie to ourselves. Here you go. I swear, they no not stand any chance. No against time. Against that, they no time. that time, they say Britain, eh? Britain was like hot, 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 hot cake. Here you get. Ah, serious hot cake. Thugs. If you go anywhere, go to wreck our book, claim the place for them. Or my room, room, they learn lesson. So our uh -huh. ancestors no really really stand chance. Omo Egba negotiated the independence. We really got the collected them back. How come nobody told us that one? That that Omo 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 that one was another interesting situation. We say Lugard collect collect independence back. I'm going to get this book I read it. You know no say there was actually a country called Egba United Kingdom. But today now we Egba people. Independence of Yoruba nation. Say, oh, Ilushi, you are once an independent, independent nation independent. that they have to fight war, Baba. Eh? Look at the independence, Baba. Want to see war? Oh, the war. 
So that's one thing about uh, history. So it will humble you. Uh, you got to learn and unlearn. And it also helps you to further research too. Like, you know, is that true? I'm going to go find out. And you read more, you know? Does happen. Hello. Hello. Uh, uh, no. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now, my ego. Oh, great. Uh, How are you? Yeah. Doing? Yeah. I'm cool. I'm cool. I'm cool. Uh, like my brother said, uh, any day we are ready to die for our freedom, that that day we are going to be regretted. But let me try to my humble opinion based on what my brother said. Uh, the problem of Africa, if you want to be free, the freedom of Africa need is total freedom. Like I said before, when I called you like last week, total freedom in the extent of both religion and colonization, because you cannot talk about me and you that uh, amalgamated together in 1914. Then we want to separate, we want to go our separate ways as we used to be before the Lord Dugardi came which is a uh, British, uh, whatever. Now, we need to, as well, because this is the same Britain that brought that religion to us, bring uh, Christian to the, bring Christianity to the East, then mix it in the West, Christian and the Muslim, then come to the North to bring Muslim. So we can be able to be able, they know this fight must be among God. That's why they, they bring different religions between us. And nobody wants it because before Africa can be able to, because I'm doing, I'm talking about Nigeria, I'm talking about Africa as well. Before Africa can be able to move forward, we need to go back the way we used to be before these people, so called white people, come. We do things on our own. And they, before the British come, I know, I believe in a history, if you would trace it, that Igbos used to do business in the north and do business in the west as well, go back to their east. And do their yeah do their own thing. They still do that trading before British came that brought us together. People with a different ideology and different culture. So you're not going to work. That religion is part of the problem. You know that religion is one of the problems. If you talk it, the leader, the religious leader don't want you to know because they have seen it as a business opportunity to make you the same people that government are frustrated. That is the thing that upsetting me. The the government are frustrating the citizens, the so-called religious leader, both Muslims, because when you talk about religious leader, people will talk, you are talking about Christianity. No, we are talking about even the Muslim, because even the Muslim, both of them are worse. If you, you read the history, you know, you know, sometimes uh, the Muslim people don't need, don't want to talk about what Arab do to the Africa. Yes, because even the, the because now, America is better in the West, that is, they have uh, African America, but they don't have African Arab. Because they kill our people, they destroy our people. But to, our people don't want to be, when you're talking about the West, they're happy when you talk about Christian. But they don't want to hear when you talk about Muslim. The Northerners are not Muslim. They became Muslim today because they are forced to do. That is the way they live their life and do their own thing in their own, the way their forefathers used to live their life. So the better we realize all those things and the, uh, all those bloggers, whatever they call themselves, that fighting for irrelevant things on social media. But the same person that fighting for a baby, he monetizes his Facebook, he has the privilege to be on social media, monetize the social media, getting money. He don't want to look after the basic things normal human being need to live. That's why one of our brothers... Give easy money and then... Uh, yes. Traffic, you know? Maybe... maybe uh, yeah. Now, that's what I'm about to say. We oh. are here, right, dealing with real life issue. My platform is also money, no doubt, okay? No, like no, no, said, no, 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 no. I mean, I'm only I understand you. something that, uh, you know, this is yes. supposed to be a thankless job anyway. Like, it's a thankless thing. Yes, if yeah. If you have to be honest. Yeah. If anybody doing this yeah. and yeah. getting to be praised or something, then you are doing the wrong thing. You are not in the right place. I get yeah, you. I, my, my, I get your yeah, you. You monetize. I you mon I know you monetize your 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 Facebook. But you monetizing your Facebook, but you educating our people. Tell them this is the way. 
people need to live life. As you are, as you are detecting for good, uh, as yeah, as you are detecting for the good things down there in Yoruba nation, likewise Biafra, and the we that are listening to you, we are not listening to you because yeah, you are just talking on social media. We are listening to you because you are giving us the light message to make so we can be able to rethink. I never see you for one day trying. I never see you on social media trying to follow them and put uh, try to drive people on irrelevant things. But, but you try to tell the citizens, guys, this is the best way to live. As you do in Britain, as you do in Scotland now, you are well comfortable. But you still remember as an African man, because an individual African man, no, he still have that polygamy. You have family there in a good state, need to be taken care of. So if I know you cannot do that, yeah, you cannot do that work by your own, even if you're making bureaus, no. The, the, it is the responsibility of the government to give your people them, yeah. the place yes. safe. You get that? Yes. It is, of us it is the responsibility to see and raise awareness. You are so right, Baba. Continue. Yes. Yes. And it is the responsibility of the government to give your poor woman or your poor sister, your the poor man in the Ogun state, to make him have a good basic amenities like hospital, good road, good good uh, electricity, water supply. Okay, let me just uh, uh, conclude on this matter now. After Jaconde tried to build houses in Lagos State, uh, he built many houses under four years. Since that Jaconde do that, after that Jaconde, I think 1979 to 85, 84. Yes. Now, nobody, no government, even South East or Southwest, have able, have able to try since 1999. Nigeria government never tried to build their house for a common people. They never tried. Yes. Now I know the, during the time of uh, regional government, I know some people that do. I know some of my uncles that do civil servants. They can be able to build four rooms and parlor because when they are civil servants, they have quarters. Government will be if you post you to work in a good state, or maybe from east. To work in a good you have quarters where you live. You can be able to save money from your work, but now government is not, they are not even looking after you. And they are trying to tell our people, let us stand up and fight these people. Don't think because you have the privilege to get money from social media, you don't, even if you get that million on social media and there is insecurity, you will still suffer. But the person who did not have money, it will be even better that because the the kidnapper will not look for a person who don't have money. They will look, they will look for the person who have money. So he cannot have life to enjoy that money you make on social media as well. That's why we are crying out. As, as I say now, if I come down to Nigeria, if I come down to Nigeria and I can be I cannot be able to travel to my village because of insecurity. So what will happen is so what is the enjoy so people will just be like uh, eh? I, why why did you have to put yourself through that? You want to pretend that you don't know what is going on. So people have to be careful so my, with all your money, with all your everything. Even with security, you still have to be very careful. Or when you are not in Nigeria, you can live your life almost like carefree. Eh? This will not be your own country or you do so, okay there. Or when you go to your own place, you have to be careful. How, how can people live like that? I, mean, I know I know Nigeria is about to, whether we like it or not, it's about to collapse. And uh, people need to stand up because Anybody that's talking about one Nigeria, the person is deceiving his We cannot work. Me and the, let me just be honest. I know we are all women, but me and the Osa man don't have the same ideology. Me and the Yoruba man, the Yoruba man has. You see what I tell people, right? Is this if I, if you say to me and say, see, my brother, me and the Yorubas, right? We don't have a, anything in common. So we want to be like that. There's nothing wrong in that. People shouldn't see that as a wrong thing. All right. Not having a lot in common simply means, right? It means simply means the, I respect you. I respect you, okay? Yes. I just want to be on my own. And, the, and anything we can do together, and let's we, do that together on a mutual arrangement. What is wrong with that? Yes. Under, yeah. under, okay. Is it not, is it not Niger? Okay, that's what they are saying. Yeah. They are no longer interested in West in Africa. The ECOWAS. They are no longer interested in ECOWAS. So, does not make the, they still, still me and you can have. Yes, me and you now, maybe Odudua and Biafra can have that uh, economic value that say we can do this thing as a different nation. It is called mutual which understand it. bilateral eh? agreement. If we say, okay, uh, so, the Igbos and the Yorubas or the Biafrans and the Oduduans, like you said, right, they are independent, autonomous uh, countries of their own, okay? 
anything where we want to do together yeah. will be called bilateral <sighs> agreement it's called based on an agreement mutual agreement okay something out of respect all these ones that all of us don't even know no my, my brother my i know that i need to i know it's not easy for you but to, we are learning for you know this period now if i didn't see you online i can i say ah what is going on because i i love to hear your message on daily basis because i'm, I'm learning I things a message now that uh, why we struck has been delivered to the reception downstairs i'm going to take a break and go yeah. grab it before i round up at this afternoon. okay okay but thank you very much uh, and you know, they, don't want, they don't want us to talk about that uh that civil war because they put it under no, propaganda talking about it until until mm -hmm. but, nigeria will accept apologize and build a very massive epithet somehow that will show that this will never happen again and the healing can actually start from there before we finally break up you don't know that the healing can start from sure, sure, sure. when nigeria take responsibility for what they did all right and they mount a monument that represents that dark era dark time in the history of nigeria and make sure that say this will never happen again then we can now start discussing whether we still want to be together or not but they don't want to take responsibility whether dead or alive we will never uh, stop talking talk mm. about it but yeah, man, I really appreciate for you to give yeah. for giving me that time to tell my, my own opinion. Thank you so much. God bless you. Eh? You have a good one, Baba. So it is true. The truth here is that uh, Nigeria doesn't want you to talk about uh, the genocide because they don't want you to offend some people. And in the process, millions of people say so, so they were denied. The millions of people they killed, those who killed them, they rewrite the history of Nigeria. They thrown so many of these things away. They rebranded themselves. They turned themselves uh, to the saviors of Nigeria. And somehow, somehow, eh, it has gone from bad to worse. And that dark time, you never leave Nigeria. People can live in denial of it. But you, you can't kill 5 million to uh, 6 million people in a genocidal war and tell people that no winner, no vanquish. Let's move on. Move on to where? Eh? Anyway, I'm going to round up uh, very soon, but I'm going to go grab. Uh, uh, see. We have this now, a father, a fatherless, uh, fatherless people. Okay. Now I'm going downstairs to the reception to grab uh, the why we struck. I want to show you that before we round it up uh, this afternoon. Okay. Don't go anywhere. Else. I'm going to leave my music on. Eh? If you stay back in five minutes, you're going to see it. And then, yes, we're going to choose a day that we're going to read all of that. Oh, it's going to be interesting. Tomorrow afternoon, I'm going to start early. We're going to read from 1 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. That's going to be four and a half hours reading tomorrow. And that's going to be, when I say uh, 12 noon, 12 uh, in the afternoon, check your time, set your time. I'll tell you more when I get back, okay? By the way.
I did uh, go out there to go and get uh, my uh, why we struck. I even believe that. I received a message that said they delivered, but it wasn't. So they came to my door and they were chopping, I mean, chopping the door and I didn't open the door. So the guy didn't deliver my book. Anyway, let me go get ready for later in the evening. Uh, for our broadcast last night, if you missed that, the replay is going to pop up on your screen very soon. Okay? Or you can just go get ready for the time the evening. I am going to see you later this evening. Thank you so much for this afternoon. Morning. Mm -hmm. Enjoy the rest of the day. Sulaki, I am good today. 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 I am good today